All right, welcome everybody um, to uh, our session during Geneva Trade Week, Leveraging Data for Development. Uh, my name is Cody Ankeny. I'm with the Information Technology and Industry uh, uh, Council and uh, IPI, and we organized this event uh, today to, to talk through um, some of the issues that that are, are kind of top of mind for a lot of people. So um, before we said, want to to just provide a, a huge thank you to the organizers of Geneva Trade Week. Um, they have been working tirelessly to put this together, and I, I think that they, you know, didn't initially have in mind that the Geneva Trade Week would be in such high demand uh, uh, because of the the cancellation of the public forum. So really huge thank you to to the organizers. I'm really happy to be here and and be part of this to, to discuss uh, some some pressing issues. Um, so today, you know, we organized this panel to to talk through um, some of the issues that that are, are are top of mind for a lot of trade negotiators and governments around the world, and that's what does data and digital technology mean for especially development in developing countries, um, and during uh, these these a lot of trade negotiations where these issues are being raised, um, how should how should they uh, be thinking about them uh, in the negotiation? Um, so I think it's it's often uh, readily apparent why a lot of uh, digital trade provisions and and, and you know data focused innovations are are, um, are beneficial for a lot of highly developed countries and, and multinational companies. Um, but you know I talk through issues that the developing countries face and, and try to talk through some of those questions that hopefully inform some some conversation um, going forward. So our, our speakers today, I think we have a really great lineup. Um, really excited to to hear from everybody today. Um, first, we're going to hear from Nigel Corey, who's the Associate Director of Trade Policy at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Uh, then we're going to hear from Anna Paula Bialer, who's partner at Bialer Facetti Asociados. Uh, then we'll hear uh, from Matthew Reisman, Director of International Trade Policy for Microsoft. Um, and last, we'll, we'll close up this session or with the prepared remarks, um, hearing from Martin Molinuevo, Senior Counsel at the World Bank. Um, so with that, um, I think that uh, we'll go ahead and just uh, jump right into, um, into the, the content here. Um, so maybe I can ask Nigel to uh, turn on his video and go ahead and start speaking. Right. Thanks, Cody. Uh, it's great to be here again. Uh, uh, thanks to the Geneva Trade Platform for putting this on. Uh, look forward to today's discussion. Um, uh, good morning or afternoon or even, uh, evening, everyone. Uh, obviously, I'm happy to lay the foundation for today's uh, discussion. When we're talking about data and the value of data, especially in the context of digital development, uh, and there, when we start, I suppose, going back to the start and talking about the value of data um, and data, there are many ways to describe it. But put simply, data is raw or, and unorganised fact, and it can contain numbers, statements, characters in a raw form. Data always requires interpretation by machines or humans to derive meaning. And it's this knowledge that comes from this meaning that then becomes the subject of valuation that, that we're focused on, right? And so thankfully, thanks to technological innovation, such as cheaper cloud storage, faster computing, better algorithms, improved data sensors, and better communication networks, uh, it's the, these have all made it easier and less expensive to collect, store, analyze, and transfer data for people and firms around the world. And it's the use of data that is central to sort of my discussion and our uh, discussion today, in that data-driven innovation, as we call it, the use of data to create value has become increasingly important to economic growth, competitiveness, scientific discovery, and social progress. There are two main points that underpin my remarks today. Firstly, that the value of data comes from how it's used and the enabling factors that support this, not from where data is stored. Success in the global data economy uh, increasingly depends on how effectively firms and individuals can leverage data to generate insights and unlock value and that data grows in value through use and reuse. And by use, I don't just mean some computer programmer, uh, but people and firms using data as customers as part of cutting edge software and services, whether domestic or traded, that allows them to be more productive and innovative and, and thus successful. 
The second main point is that all sectors and countries benefit from greater use and transfers of data and digital goods and services as their critical inputs to improving firm competitiveness and economic productivity. So, how much data is there and what is it? Well, shortly, I mean, in short, that there's a lot and we sort of have some ideas of sort of what it is or how to break it down. Um, a 2017 IBM report made the estimate that 90% of the data in the world was created in the two previous years at some estimated 2.5 quadrillion bytes of data a day. And while it's hard to know exactly what all this data is, we have some idea in that a 2018 Sandvine analysis of global internet traffic by major telecommunication firms showed that video is almost 58% of down, uh, total downstream traffic, followed by general web traffic, such as browsing with 17%. And I just wanted to briefly highlight this as it, I think it highlights an important part of the policy debate in that a lot of it is dominated by the concerns over personal data. And yes, obviously there are massive data privacy concerns when we're talking about this, but the majority of data is non-personal. So this highlights that it deserves both broader and specific attention when we're talking about it. So what's the value of data? Most of the analogies that scholars and pundits use end up having limited utility for policy-making purposes, and many are just misleading. Data is neither cash nor a commodity, and pursuing policies based on these misconceptions or just damage the digital economy. Value depends on the actor, whether it's governments, firms, individuals, or society as a whole. It's context specific. And people mean different things when they talk about value. Value arises when businesses create jobs or engage in trade or become more productive, when governments deliver more effective public services, and when data is used to improve uh, environmental or societal outcomes. Also, the value that consumers gain is massive in terms of them being some of the main beneficiaries due to the benefits of free services. Yet this is too often overlooked or undercounted by policymakers. And what this gives rise to is the, uh, the question that to, uh, uh, to effectively manage the digital economy, it in part depends on our ability to better assess and measure the use and value of data and that of digital goods and services, including free ones, and how it's used across borders and, with, and within society in the impact that different policies have on these. And while precise measurement in terms of the value of data is difficult, I just want to briefly outline today four key characteristics of data that policymakers can use to help them understand the general answer to this question about the value of data and thus help inform their decisions. The first is that data is non-rivalrous, meaning that one person or firm's use of it does not diminish its availability to others. For example, one business's Collecting of a user's age or location does not preclude another from doing the same. And so this means that it's possible for the same data to support the creation of several new products, services, or methods of production. It also means that any company can engage with the same data in different data sharing arrangements. In this way, the value uh, resulting from data can be exploited to its maximum multiple times. And this is why reusable and multi-purpose use of data is important. And what this means is that a goal for policymakers should be to encourage many firms to be data rich rather than fear that data is a finite resource that must be evenly distributed. The second main characteristic, much of the value of, uh, that firms derive from data comes not from individual data points, but from collective data, so-called big data, which is where most of the value is created in today's global digital economy. Um, for example, while having data about the location and speed of a particular car may be interesting, it's not all that valuable except for the people in the car. But accumulating data from thousands of cars and displaying it on a map is incredibly valuable to first responders and for people uh, arranging trips around town. But this also highlights why, in terms of aggregated data, why cross-border data flows are important in how they help firms build bigger, better data sets for them to extract insights and to deliver these back across borders as digital goods and services, in that this allows globally based value creation and distribution. The third factor is it's not just about quantity, but quality of data, such as the completeness, accuracy and timeliness of data. And this in part depends on the form the data takes and how hard it is to aggregate with other data to make better data sets. 
And what it shows is that competitive advantage for firms is not necessarily acquired by accumulating lots of data, but by developing the capabilities to make better use of high quality data consistently over time. And finally, the precise value of data is hard to calculate as it changes. There's a temporal uh, dimension in that some data is extremely valuable when it's first created, but others it degrades over time. But existing data also has unpredictable future value given new data, technologies and algorithms could lead to new insights from old data. And this is why organisations may keep data for its potential value rather than its current value. So what does this mean? Uh, what does data mean for trade and economics? It, which is obviously data has changed economics and global trade in that success in today's data-driven economy depends on how effectively organisations can leverage data to generate insights and unlock value and how firms and individuals use data and digital tools as much as possible wherever this data and these digital tools come from. Firms in all industries, not just the tax sector, benefit from data, data flows and digital technologies. Automotive and manufacturing firms, supermarket and other retail firms, agricultural firms, services. And these benefits apply to all countries at all levels of development. Obviously how they apply depends again on context and what's most useful for people and firms in different countries. And that's the challenge for the policymakers and their firms and the development partners, right? Is to understand that context and identify the challenges and the opportunities to help build the capabilities for them to make the best use of data and digital technologies for domestic commerce, international trade, and broader societal goals. So, what can policymakers do to make data more valuable? The right strategy, we think, includes a few key points encouraging the broad adoption of ICTs such as through reducing its cost, uh, cutting taxes and tariffs on these, improving ICT infrastructure, maximising the supply of reusable data, improving countries' data-related regulatory capabilities, building workers' data science and data literacy skills, and updating trade rules to provide the critical economies of scale that are central to digital trade. And I outline all of these suggestions in reports that I'm happy to share separately. Doing the right thing also means avoid, uh, uh, avoiding the wrong things, like requiring data to be stored and processed domestically, as this not, does not lead to sort of uh, value extraction from data, nor does it lead to digital development. While data centres contain expensive hardware and create some temporary construction costs, they employ relatively staff. So it's important that policymakers resist the data localization trap and instead focus on the fundamentals of ICT and data adoption and use. In conclusion, for all countries developed and developing, the economy will be most productive and innovative when individuals and firms, whether in agriculture, manufacturing and services, can, can engage in digital activity and commerce without unnecessary restrictions on how they can use and transfer data. Of course, there are many legitimate policy concerns related to that data, but it's about understanding these, figuring out the best way to address them, while also being aware of the inevitable trade-offs in terms of what this means for data-driven innovation and digital trade. And for uh, trade policymakers, the challenge is how to create new frameworks that maximise the value of data while accounting for legitimate public policy objectives. And because at the moment, the WTO rules are either missing, out of date, or not clear and enforceable. And this has led to the proliferation of a range of barriers of policies that constitute digital protectionism. And this is the challenge that countries and policymakers in Geneva and elsewhere around the world are facing as they uh, try and figure out these new digital trade rules. Anyway, I'll leave it there. And I, again, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Nigel. <clears throat> Appreciate that. Um, and just so for, for the people that are um, uh, or the participants that are, that are observing right now that are using the WebEx platform, we will have an opportunity for questions uh, at the at the end of the prepared presentations. Um, so just uh, keep in mind that you will have an opportunity to, to raise a question if you want to, to uh, put down some notes. And you, you're welcome to aim a question at a specific speaker or, or um, ask uh, everybody. And we're, I'm happy to direct that to the person that you identify. Um, the Q and A uh, uh, chat function is is how that um, that's going to work. Um, but without delay, uh, let's go ahead and move on now to uh, Anna Paula Biala. Thank you, Cody. 
Um, it's um, it's a great honor and pleasure to to share this roundtable and discussion with you. Um, and I'd like to just say thanks, especially to Cody and ITI for the invitation. Uh, I'm a lawyer and public consultant in Brazil. So the, the discussion around developing country um, is very close to home. Um, as you all know, Brazil is a pretty uh, vast territory with striking conflicts amongst its various uh, regions. And digital technologies are a completely intangible concept in some areas of the country, and yet a driving force in the most developed states like Sao Paulo, where I am. Um, and I guess the quick question is how to transform adoption of digital technology into really a federal uh, policy that could um, encompass uh, the such different challenges in the in the whole country, and uh, in, to a certain extent, Brazil started um, its um, its road uh, towards that in 2018 with the publication of a digital transformation strategy, which was followed by the digital government strategy, and um, more recently, the, the data protection law. But despite such important structural policies, there is this pretty still a low level of maturity at the government uh, level in terms of uh, really grasping and understanding the interplay between um, these initiatives and policy that have actually been um, approved and are on the way of being implemented and the reality of digital trade or even the the global nature of the ICT um, a sector and, and all the discussion around um, scale and even the need for harmonization and global consensus-based approach to um, this new reality. Um, so the, the discussion really is, um, let's say, in its first steps in a certain way. Obviously, the expansion of the internet in ecosystem has enabled you know, economic growth, innovation, and opportunity. Uh, and we have a number of economic studies that show how much the global economy has grown and the role that the cyberspace, so to speak, has had in terms of job creation and um, uh, ability for growth and existence of small and medium um, enterprises in, in a country uh, with um, a population like Brazil, for instance, as it would be for any developing country, having um, uh, cheaper and easier access to uh, digital technologies uh, would certainly ben uh, be an important benefit um, in terms of um, actually allowing them to, to access this new reality. And while this was true before the pandemic, um, kind of our new normal uh, reinforces the relevance of this reality and of digital trade as a driver and really a pillar for sustainable economic development. Um, um, it, back in 2015, uh, though a bit old, I liked the study that Deloitte, Deloitte published a study on, on the relationship that um, social media had, especially for small companies, and how it would uh, really project them both nationally and globally, uh, reduce uh, barriers to marketing or actually allow them to to market and be known, be known uh, and obviously with that generating uh, really significant economic impact. Um, I'm familiar with a couple of cases, uh, one uh, that is a, you know, a really tiny, small family, three women, northeast of Brazil, uh, had never left, uh, left the city, were able to actually uh, launch a pretty successful business through uh, a platform like that, uh, just by you know selling arts and crafts via Facebook, and and and, and what I'm saying is obviously. Uh it's unquestionable that digital transformation empowers users and providers and, you know, make them uh, choose how to access and deliver service. And in some cases, actually uh, just give them the tools to, to do that. It, that do that is not even a matter of um, a choice. Uh, the greatest challenge I believe we face uh, and governments face is to meet uh, these new expectations uh, with the reality of an extremely outdated um, mindset uh, and really uh, regulatory structure. So governments are adapting public policy to um, this whole new uh, collaborated approach in the digital age, new, um, the new digital uh, to a certain extent has um, brought government closer uh, to a number of the um, 
uh, of the services that society needs. Uh, but of course, to become fully digital, governments need to adopt and use digital technologies and data as the strategic components of their efforts to modernize the public sector. Uh, and um, I'll second Nigel here on how important the use of data and reuse of data um, is in terms of uh, allowing for the integration of core processes and activities in order to really establish new ways of working and promoting greater openness and collaboration. And the first step, as simple as it may sound, is really to know uh, the data you process, which in the case of developing countries, uh, it's not that obvious and it's not that simple. You often have different structures, different databases, and not a, a, a continuous uh, mapping uh, of that flow of data in or even for the use of data. Uh, the current administration in Brazil has already committed to digitalize nearly um, all of its about 4,000 public services uh, with a view to help integrate uh, the data and really get more benefit out of it. Um, they have so far been able to digitalize about 1,000 uh, of the services, which is already enormous progress, but we obviously still have uh, a long way to, uh, to go, even though it certainly feels we are on the right track towards um, a effective digital tr transformation. And then, you know, if it's all good, uh, where is the, the big catch? And um, I would go to international data flow as being uh, on the one of the bases of the, the greatest challenge that we have facing forward. Um, a global oriented regime to data flow, avoiding the creation of uh, frontiers to the digital world uh, is um, clearly one of the fundamentals for digital trade and the digital economy uh, to foster. And more than that, for one, to really shift the mindset of what we used to have and what we need um, to have. The digital transformation is not just a matter of doing what you used to do in digital platforms. It's really about uh, rethinking uh, process, uses of data and services and what can be um, actually offered. Uh, one of the uh, one of the the, the challenges uh, of this um, international data flow is the is the really appetite of um, wanting to look at data um, as if it were a, a component uh, that you use to manufacture locally and wanting to keep it locally so uh, you could have access to it and know. Uh, what was uh, going on uh, with it. Uh, but of course, that brings a, an important challenge uh, and, and negative consequence to, to that flow. Um, I do like a study by McKinsey, 2016, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that over a decade, uh, the types of uh, data flows that act together increase substantially the world of GDP in relation to what would have resulted um, in a world without cross-border data flows. And uh, obviously, we also have a number of studies that show that cross-border data flow now generate more economic value than traditional flow of trades and goods. And I'm not saying one is more important than the other. Uh, they are both very uh, important. Uh, the the question is how we can um, overstep and overlook the idea that uh, establishing barriers to the online world will actually uh, bring benefits um, to to the economy. And we've actually um, seen this um, in different moments of, uh, uh, specifically in the case of Brazil, of its history. And on and off, we go back, for instance, to the discussion on data localization and while data localization restrictions um, are often um, considered, um, they do have uh, a specific context for being considered in terms of uh, addressing specific pu public policy objectives. Um, I do believe um, it's uh, more than than evident that as a role, uh, this tends to add an additional layer of cost and barrier for the development of digital economy, especially if we go on to uh, the, the actually the capex cost of, uh, for instance, a data center in a country where it's, you still have um, high tax structure, high electricity costs, uh, and so on. 
So um, usually, uh, I would say that even though the, the policy objectives around uh, the restrictions on international data flow or mandatory data localization may, uh, may often be legitimate, the implementation of these barriers um, may, uh, are likely ineffective. Uh, they don't reach the intended objective, and most often than, than not, they end up um, limiting uh, the country's ability to actually participate in a global uh, scenario and in the digital um, trade overall. Um, and usually, personal data protection um, and law enforcement are amongst the objectives that are most likely uh, involved when we have discussions around the restriction to uh, free flow, uh, free flow of data. And um, as we've seen in in many countries, this usually come at a pretty high economic and social cost. Uh, the pandemic scenario has strengthened the reality of data flows to which we are increasingly inserted into. Uh, with the uh, quarantine or lockdown, depending on where many people had to adapt to a new routine and adhere to the technological solutions, uh, the pandemic has created a world in which video conference applications have become more critical. Uh, remote work is the new normal, as is online schooling for you know, for good or for bad, uh, healthcare services and so so other services are all happening uh, online. And um, uh, again, going back to Nigel's point, uh, the, the the investment in ICT infrastructure and the broad ab adoption of ICT, um, starting with um, broadband connectivity, which is not a given uh, in many development countries, is also one of the, the key initiatives that need to embrace to actually allow the fostering and the development of the whole um, digital economy. And before I run out of time, I just wanted to stress that this new reality brings a change in mindset um, towards data and the role of data in the digital economy. And concepts such as data minimization, uh, privacy by design, security by default, and accountability uh, must be the new normal for, the, for those facing the digital transformation challenge. It's really not just keep using the data uh, with different roles, it's really understanding the new uh, context and the new uses and rules around the use um, of data. Um, countries can shape domestic, domestic legislation on cross-border data flows that enables and facilitates global information exchange while still protecting important regulatory goals and effective working towards economic and social development. And um, a lot of people say that data is the new oil. And uh, I would be, I would here actually disagree a bit. Data and then this most important, uh, this is the most important fuel of the 21st century in the sense that uh, it's even more relevant than oil to the extent that it does not come to an end. Uh, you actually um, find uh, more and more benefits the more data you, you have and, and the more time passes, the more data uh, we, we store and we are able to, to actually use. Uh, and um, I think the underlying message here is that we need to ensure uh, that data is protected, and especially when we're talking about personal data, it's duly protected. Uh, that trust is really a value of the digital economy, um, and, and it is an underpinning value, as we often stress. And we must not forget that the use of um, such a, an important resource and thus its free, free, free flow really needs to be um, incentivized and facilitated. And for that to happen, I believe, it may require a more flexible interpretation uh, on the role of data in our economy, uh, more flexible interpretation in terms of how to apply uh, the regulation, uh, how to really define what is personal data and what should be the underlying conditions for its use. Uh, and with this, uh, and revisiting uh, this whole uh, regulatory um, system around uh, the use of data, we would certainly benefit as an economy and society as a whole. And um, Cody, back to you. Thank you for the opportunity and um, honor to participate in this discussion. Thanks, Anna. That was <clears throat> that was really fantastic. And I think that um, there are a couple points you made that uh, I that I want to come back to later in the Q and A section. 
um, uh, that I think um, Nigel touched on them as well. But before we get there, uh, I we'll want to go ahead and, and pass the mic off to Matthew to uh, present his prepared remarks. Thank you so much, Cody. Um, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, so glad to be with you wherever you may be. Um, and it's really hard to follow Nigel and Ana Paula, given how comprehensively they've covered I think, the stakes um, and, and the facts about the data economy and, and the wonderful job they did in laying out the, the policy ecosystem that, that fosters the, the use of data for development. So where does that leave me? Um, that leaves me, I think, as what we call in sports commentary sometimes as the color man. Um, so I'm going to try and, and illustrate a little bit based on, on the beautiful job they did in, in kind of setting the, the foundation of the facts. So look at us. Um, I'm coming to you from my living room. Um, this is the first time I've worn a tie in six months. Um, I've been sitting here most of that time. I won't tell you what's on my feet or not. Um, we, have, um, we have Nigel, looks like he's in his living room, maybe Cody too. Can't tell, maybe Martin, Anna. Um, this is our new life. Um, and behind me, if you hear any background noise, you've got one of my kids in his virtual classroom. You've got two in the, in the, in the living room over there. Um, and you may at any time see uh, my wife come through who's getting ready to start her workday online. And you may even be uh, video bombed by my three-year-old just because. Um, some other things that we're doing online in this house, um, in the last few months, we've visited with our doctor and done some appointments for my son who's seen his specialist for a lung condition he has. Um, we've done quite a lot of online shopping. Um, and, and, and back to my wife, she's, a, she's actually a government official and working in, in the Virginia legislature and meeting with her colleagues, doing the, doing the people's business. So everything from, this is virtually every aspect of our lives and not to mention the video call we did with our, we have a new baby and with the grandparents last night. So this is pretty much every aspect of our life. It's been really hard in the last six months. I don't know about you, but managing all this within the walls of one house on the one hand is extraordinarily challenging, but I also recognize that the ability to do everything I just told you is an extraordinary privilege. Um, I know that each of us who's on this call really is among the luckiest people in the world. Why do I say that? If you're on this call with me, with us today, that means you've got a good enough broadband connection to do that. That means you've got access to a, a device that allows you to do that. Um, and so many people, it, not even you know around the world, but even in, I live in, in Virginia, we have large parts of the state where people don't have access to a fast enough broadband connection to do this. Um, and, and we have children who are camped out in parking lots around the county so that they can get online for school. And if that's the case in one of the richest countries in the world, Imagine what it is in so many other places. Um, so this is, I guess, the message I wanted to have for you. As hard as it's been to live online, uh, it, it feels like uh, an extraordinary privilege, and I believe it is, but it shouldn't be a privilege. It shouldn't be a luxury. This is about, these are, everything I laid out are the basic functionings of society, are the basic aspects of a good life. This is why data is important for development. Uh, uh, this shouldn't be restricted to the richest uh, and, and the privileged few. And the policies that Nigel laid out and the policies that Anna Paula laid out, that's what this is about at the end of the day, getting those policies right. Now, that's easy for me to say. Um, uh, I can, I, one thing I like to do when talking with a group like this, um, which I, I was looking at the roster, I love that it's a diverse group. I see folks from the Philippines, from Malawi, um, from, uh, from the United States, from across Europe. Um, I imagine folks may have a lot of questions, some skeptical questions that they may feel too shy to ask. I hope you will ask anything that's on your mind. But a few that I could see come to mind is, isn't it nice for you, representative of a large multinational tech company, to talk about the value of sharing data? Um, isn't, that a, uh, isn't that convenient for you to say that it's non-exclusive and it's not oil? Then why are you saying it's so important? So here's what I'd say to you. Um, I love that Anna Paula finished her remarks talking about trust. It is incumbent upon all of us in industry, all of us who are devoted to uh, disseminating these policies and encouraging their adoption to earn your trust, to encourage, to, to make you, to show you and demonstrate through our actions that we have your trust foremost, foremost in mind and that we will protect your data, that we will keep it safe. And at the end of the day, that's what these policies are about. Um, it's also about 
uh, demonstrating, and I think we have ample evidence to do that, that when you get the policy framework right, it's not just about us getting into markets around the world, but in the fostering of the development of indigenous tech ecosystems that welcome foreign participation, but also have robust domestic development. And I think there's a lot of evidence to support that. We're certainly proud to be in over 120 countries and we're not alone, um, but we don't operate alone. We, everywhere we go, we have from, depending on the country, dozens to hundreds to thousands of partners in the local tech e ecosystem that we help build up with us. And getting the policy environment right allows that flourishing to happen. And again, where I started, getting the policy environment right, and I think there's ample evidence to show it, fosters access to technology, both by offering greater access to broadband and access to the devices and services that allow people to use those services to have a better life. So without going into much more um, on these points, I really want to leave the seat in your mind to think about those questions you have. I hope you'll put them forward in the discussion. Uh, I'm really glad to be with you, thanks so much. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, and now to, to close off our prepared remarks, so I'll, I'll pass it off to Martin. Thank you, Cody. And uh, well, thanks for uh, um, to the ITI for, uh, for this uh, invitation. I'm delighted to be here with uh, this uh, great panel. I have prepared. Um, I have a, a few slides that I want to that I will be going through. I will probably be deviating a lot from these slides, mostly because I put them there so you don't have to see my face and you have something more interesting to look at. Um, <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> I want to first, you know, have a. I want to focus my discussion on a bit of the con on the development context of uh, trade uh, rules and especially on digital trade rules. Um, you know, some of my uh, fellow speakers have already mentioned some of these uh, of the things. I will, uh, um, so they have laid out very nicely the, uh, the floor for me. Um, so I want to focus on, uh, uh, on that context, and in the end, I will mention something about the World Development Report that we are working on at the World Bank. You know, it will be a little bit of an infomercial, if you don't mind. Um, <clears throat> first, start with something that I think we all agree that data is empowering trade in uh, in the 21st century. Um, <clears throat> for that, I think I like to to use a an example of a, of a firm that I had the pleasure of visiting a few years ago. It was a firm in uh, a startup in in Dhaka in uh, in Bangladesh, and uh, and the firm what it did was sub, uh, providing services to doctors in the United States um, to basically do the paperwork for uh, for medical doctors in the United States. Uh, as the, you know, as a result of Obamacare and uh, the uh, and the insurance policies, doctors have a huge uh, ad administrative burden. So, so what this firm has done was providing U.S.-based doctors with um, smart uh, glasses, with uh, Google glasses, in fact, um, and having a, um, an assistant based in Bangladesh witnessing remotely the the intervention. The, uh, the visit, of course, you know, with all the the privacy measures at place, you know, and, and the consent of the patients and so on. But that allowed uh, the doctor, uh, basically it was, an, uh, in, in average, it would uh, reduce the administrative um, a burden of two hours a day for the doctors. Uh, so it was two more hours that the, that the doctors could be used uh, um, working on patients and seeing patients and having all the paperwork ready and, um, by, uh, by the end of the day. So, he, and, uh, and the, um, the platform that the, uh, the, the firm was using was Google Glass and, in, and all sort of, on, and, uh, and a, a range of, uh, of Google services, you know, including translation and so on. Why I want to mention this is because this kind of trading services was clearly data-driven, Digital data was at the core of the service, and importantly, 
it was a, it was possible because both the United States and Bangladesh in this case had a pretty liberal and progressive regime for data um, for data transfers. Have uh, have any of these two countries have any strong restrictions that would um, for data it would oops sorry it uh, it would have been detrimental both for the United States for the health services in the United States and for the uh, startup in, in Bangladesh. So definitely um, data is at the core, is at the center of uh, a, a trade in the 21st century, and that has bring major benefits uh, in social and economic development across the board. But it's true that, you know, digital trade is not a reality for, uh, you know, for everyone. Some of my, uh, you know, our, our speakers mentioned already the challenges of broadband connectivity around the world, um, and that is uh, and that is true. Only half of the world remains connected to the it is now connected to the internet, and among those not connected to the internet is mostly in Asia and Africa, in uh, in, in middle and low income countries, and those who are connected to the internet still doesn't mean that it's a great internet. In Sweden, it would take you about 12 minutes to download an HD movie, and uh, and in Pakistan, it would take you probably around 12 hours if the connection doesn't crash. So forget about for you know forget about streaming, and also forget about businesses that need to rely on uh, on fast and solid connections to the internet. So <clears throat> so digital trade. For, for many countries remains still aspirational. And I want to highlight three main structural challenges here. Of course, digital connectivity that we already mentioned, um, skills, talents, shortage, including on soft skills like managerial skills, um, remain a key bottleneck in, in, in the developing world. And finally is the finan financial systems. Access to electronic payments is uh, is still uh, not mainstream, even in uh, in high income countries. Um, uh, in many uh, in many occasions, e commerce is paid through cash on delivery or other uh, non online uh, systems. So access to so financial systems that provide channels for electronic payments and access to finance for digital startups is an important uh, restriction to um, to the you know for the developing world and those are macro issues those are issues that are beyond the digital trade uh, uh, core if you want yeah so if we look at um uh, if we look at the the at um trade uh, negotiations on on digital commerce we find uh, that uh, for the most part this um, current talks especially in the context of the e-commerce negotiations in, in the w, at the wto or in geneva at least um, they have focused broadly on uh, data localization and uh, many many countries many participants have uh, have used uh, um, some agreements like the cptpp and the nafta 2.0 as, as reference, as possible models that uh, that could um, um, set a path for uh, for the negotiations. Just for a reminder, you know, for uh, for our audience who are not familiar with this, basically, you know, like some of the main feature of these uh, of these agreements is that they they provide some prohibitions with some caveat, with some exceptions on regulatory restrictions to, to cross-border data flows and on server localizations. Um, in addition to that, they, it has a, these agreements have a, soft, um, a series of soft law provisions on, on other regulatory requirements like electronic documentation and like consumer protection and so on. But these are mostly soft, uh, um, soft law provisions. So at the core of the uh, of the e-commerce discussions are the are rules on cross-border data flows. Now, if we look at the world today, 
data localization one is not necessarily the main the main limitation to digital trade, especially from a you know from a developing world. If um, uh, if we look at the what can what uh, uh, the regulatory regime for cross border data flow, we have that a few the dark blue ones in uh, in the map have uh, some very some very restrictive uh, um, regimes. One what we call the uh, government control. Whereas, uh, but those but those regimes are really currently less than ten percent of the world uh, of the countries that we surveyed in the in in this case. For the most part, the overall regimes are. Um, either more open, more generally open, or subject to more to more specific regulatory conditions, such as uh, you know model after the the GDPR. Um, there are data localization requirements are, are are certainly more common um, on a sectoral on on a, on a narrower basis on a, on some sectors you know, on some sectors such as finance, such as health. Um, or in some um, regulatory policies, such as government procurement. Basically, a number of countries, including most states in the United States, have provisions for which, when they contract digital services, they would require a, um, a, uh, the service provider to be to have some facility domestically, even within the state. So. Broad restrictions to broad data localization requirements are a rarity. Narrow ones are common, but those common ones, again, would likely fall under some of the uh, gaps in, in, in trade rules, either on the exceptions or on the fact that trade rules don't really cover um, government uh, regimes. So data localization is probably not, I, I, uh, I'm gonna be a little bit of a devil side advocate here, but data localization requirements are probably not the main restriction to, to digital trade right now. Instead, um, what is probably much more important these days is that divergent and inconsistent that um, data governance rules across the world, where, uh, where countries have some some types of um, uh, not restrictions but uh, rules on digit, on uh, on cross border flows and those rules don't match, so that kind of regulatory divergent is creating a does create a burden, especially for the developing world, uh, that limits cross border data flows to some extent much more than. Uh, it's certainly much more than uh, formal data requirements. Now, if we, if we focus on a uh, broader set of uh, digital uh, regulation, we find that many areas in, in digital regulation are still um, under regulatory experimentation. If we look at privacy, if we look at intermediary liability, competition, digital taxation, all of these areas, the digital technologies have, bring, have brought important challenges to all of these areas, and, uh, and they have posed policy questions that are not currently solved. You know, um, countries are still experimenting on what are the, the right solutions on digital taxation, on, on, safe, on, uh, on safe harbor and in, in, for intermediary liability, and certainly on, on privacy, where we just see how Cross-border data flows is being challenged, you know, from uh, in Europe through the Schrems II um, decision in the United States with uh, not allowing a service like TikTok. So there are many. So digital regulation is still hard, very much experimental, not only for middle-income or low-income countries. But even for low, for high income countries with strong regulatory capacities and uh, understanding. So in this context, a trade agreement that set, that uh, um, that sets prohibitions is probably not exactly what you need. Uh, 
yes, I mean, provisions, certain provisions may make sense, but, um, but there are a number of questions that are yet still not settled. Where you want to, where where you may want to have some room for for experimentation. So where does that leave these uh, trade negotiations from a, you know from a development perspective? I would say that these uh, these negotiations currently offer little of interest for developing country. Some of the bigger challenges. As we said, uh, digital connectivity, um, skills, finance are not part of the discussion for good reason. I mean, there are probably, it, it probably that's not the forum, but uh, but it's not part of the discussion. Um, and when it comes to regulatory matters, this is. These uh, negotiations, how far, are focusing on, well, limiting data localization requirements, which is probably a good idea, but, uh, but offering little else, little guidance on what are the right tools for, uh, <clears throat> for regulating trade. Um, I'm going to take, I'm, I'm going to agree with, uh, with Nigel here, and in, in a way that I hope that he, uh, he doesn't find that I'm cheating or, or twisting his words, but, uh, um, <clears throat> but Nigel said from a policy perspective that, you know, you should avoid the data localization trap and you should focus on the fundamentals of data adoption and use. And, the, and that is certainly true for policymakers. And that is also true for, um, for data governance at the international level. Data localization, focus on data localization, yes, you know, that, that is an important area that should be tackled, but it shouldn't be the only one. There are, cert, as I uh, said, there are certain fundamentals on data adoption that should also be considered. I'm going to skip this and, uh, um, and leave it for the Q&A session uh, if we want to dig a little bit deeper on what should be included in this uh, development agenda. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm going to jump to a little bit of an information, information on our uh, next work. Uh, so part of this discussion um, and, uh, and a much broader one will be tackled, will, will be covered in, uh, in the uh, next, um, World Development Report in the two, in, in 2021, which is focused on data for better lives. Um, uh, the World Bank uh, flagship publication uh, will be looking at how data, the role of data on development, um, not only as a channel, uh, as a tool for the private sector or for trade, as we are discussing today, but also how data can uh, strengthen uh, civil society and improve uh, government services delivery. So it will, uh, so it will be a much, um, much broader discussion. There will be one on trade, which I'm uh, being honored to, to lead. Uh, so I <clears throat> invite everybody to keep it on the loop and hopefully in uh, February next year will be, will be up. Uh, this is all for me now and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Martin. That was really interesting. And I think it's a good segue to our, our question and answer period. Um, so just for, for those that are observing on the, the Cisco or the WebEx platform, you can put forward questions at this time. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and I have a couple prepared questions that, that we might go through. And then as questions come in, I'll um, I'll feed those into the discussion, <clears throat> but we do have a discussion question uh, for the this this portion of the the event. Um, the question that we have uh, prepared is is what does what role does digital trade policy play in encouraging development, and how can governments in developing economies and least developed countries embrace these opportunities? So that's think of that as kind of an overall kind of question that we're trying to answer. Um, through this discussion, uh, but I think there are a couple of specific things that I wanted to to bring back up from presentations. 
um, and, and maybe a couple other things that, that we can um, add on because I'd just be generally, genuinely interested to hear all of your thoughts on, on some of these. So the first one, and um, I think is, is an area where it sounds like we may have uh, some um, open questions about how to address different issues in the WTO context. Um, so I'd really, I would like to go back to that a little bit and maybe flesh it out a, a little bit. And, you know, in particular, I think um, there, there's two questions associated with this. And the first one is, is that the slide that, um, that you, you kind of went over quickly, Martin, that you asked if we can come back to, and I think that's a great idea. And it's a question of what should the development agenda uh, what what are the things that we should be thinking about in the trade context that would enable developing economies to take advantage of the opportunities of data and digital technologies? Um, so that's the first question, a uh, more broad kind of open-ended question. The second one I think is, is something that you all touched on to some degree, and it's this perceived tension between cross-border data flows and non-economic policy issues like the, the three that come to my mind that I, I run into the most in, in my work is privacy, cybersecurity, and law enforcement access to data. Those, those three things, in, in my view, tend to be some of the most um, uh, common uh, perceived uh, issues um, in, in, in conflict with cross-border data flows. So I, I would like to just have a, a, a question, a discussion on that as well. I know some of you addressed it, but to the extent we want to flesh it out a little bit, um, what are ways that developing countries in particular should be looking at these three issues in, uh, in relation to cross-border data flows and what is the, uh, the role of trade policy in, in that thought process? Um, so big question as well. I mean, I, I think uh, address it to the extent that, that you want um, and, and you don't have to hit everything um, uh, in, in that response as well. But uh, maybe in, uh, we'll go back uh, the order that we went to start with. So Nigel, if I can go to you first to, to answer uh, either of those questions. Yeah, no, uh, thanks for that. I mean, these are the big questions that underpin pretty much every discussion I had with officials from developing countries. Uh, to, to go to your main one about the role of trade policy in the WTO and to push back a little bit on, on Martin's view of it, but although I agree with most of it, is that I think there's enormous value that developing countries can have in just participating in the process that is at the WTO uh, because they've, it's open-ended. You don't need to sign up to the end rules. You can participate to learn about the discussions going on to help inform them as to, well, what are these countries doing as it relates to these issues? How are they approaching it and why? And why are they pushing towards certain objectives uh, within the trade context? Uh, because that's important because countries are at various uh, varying levels of, of sophistication as it relates to engaging with these issues of international data governance and digital trade. Um, so there's that part of it, and which then can then help inform them as to what they should do at home. But the part I definitely agree with Martin is that I think it's, it's it, in engaging in that way, they have to recognise that they need to take a holistic approach in looking at this. The WTO and trade rules are only going to take care of sort of one part of the equation and that there is a broader sort of ecosystem. But I think it's an important sort of uh, part of the philosophy that it would hopefully embed for them in terms of recognising the opportunity of open, rules-based, uh, innovative uh, digital trade and, and embracing that from the start as they then go back at home and figure out how do they want to address all of the various data related issues at home? So, and I, and I think embedding that philosophy early is very important, uh, especially in contrast to the alternate philosophy of uh, digital restrictions, digital protectionism and data localization. And so in terms of like highlighting some of those key conceptual benefits by engaging in the process with some of the world's leading economies, digital economies, even if they're at a obviously a lower level of development and 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 stage of preparedness. So anyway, I'll I'll leave it at that, and then uh, let the others take on the other parts. Thanks, Nigel. Uh, Anna, do you have uh, anything to add? Um, sure. I'm, I'm thinking about Nigel's comment in terms of the the value of developing um, countries participating in the discussion, and uh, I absolutely see the value, but I also see um, the danger in the sense that uh, you don't really have 
sometimes all the whole background in the context in which some of the discussions are happening and you tend to want to jump ahead so for instance let's look at ai for example there are a lot, a lot of discussions around ai in the, in several countries and there is a reality uh, that is so far away from many of the developing countries that once you participate in the discussion you just want to kind of bring it close to home and you think it's a good idea to regulate that and you're often not nearly as close to what you need to be to understand the impact so i don't disagree that there should be a participation but i think there is a downfall uh, that uh, quite often is to accelerate uh, the certain discussions when the country is not not there yet. Um, and um, and Cody, I really like the way that you framed the, the idea of the perceived tension uh, on on data localization uh, and, and the questions around privacy and cyber and law enforcement. And I think often there is. Um, a, a lack of understanding uh, that these are legitimate concerns. They are ab absolutely central for the digital trade and digital economy. And there are numerous ways that countries can address those concerns that do not necessarily arise from the data localization obligation. And, and here, I think it's one of the situations where we are looking at what we used to do uh, in the, the physical environment in, the, in, uh, in terms of, I want this plant here in my country fabricating this because I need to have access to this uh, and just replicating that to the digital environment without actually um, sophisticating the discussion or understanding that uh, in, in, in the idea of a borderless uh, internet and is that exactly a borderless internet and that for it to function properly, uh, it really needs to be a, a global environment. And, um, and and maybe one of the challenges of um, at least development, the developed countries is really um, to, to address uh, the issue of understanding that that you're no longer no longer looking at more localized uh, regulatory frameworks, but rather you're not losing sovereignty by working um, uh, as a global uh, regulatory framework. So yet again, um, difficult to follow up when when folks have covered such key points. I'll just say a couple of things. One, um, Martin, I loved your your slides because you you mixed it up for us a little bit. Um, I will, I, 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 uh, there was a slide that showed a map of data localization policies. Um, and I thought I just would note that while you noted that 10% of uh, policies seem to have a localization element, if you look at the countries that were in dark on your slide, they're a pretty large share of the world's population from, uh, I would submit more than 10%. And if you look at uh, other countries that are very seriously considering such policies, it could pushes it up quite a notch further. So it's just a that's that's not meant to uh, dispute the fact you presented, but to present uh, another perspective on it. Um, and I think that that point is not necessarily in tension with the other point you made, which was a super important one for businesses like ours, which is that heterogeneity that you talk about is more broadly speaking with tech policy regulation, one of the biggest challenges we face. Microsoft is a company that is a, a physical presence in about 120 countries and operates in about 190. Um, that's a lot of places. That's a lot of tech policy ecosystems to stay on top of. And to me, the promise of the digital trade talks at the WTO and where there is value for every country is how can we move towards uh, that interoperability that you talked about and that you highlighted uh, in ways that preserve the freedom to regulate in ways that address the, the legitimate objectives that you laid out then that were described by Cody, um, but also to the greatest extent possible, move to interoperability. That benefits everybody's ability to access the technology. Um, and you know, Cody mentioned privacy, cybersecurity, and law enforcement access to data. We totally agree um, that these are these are topmost challenges. Again, they're 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 really the central issues of tech policy right now. Um, I think that the way to go forward is there are examples from countries who have built these frameworks of ways, and this is what I think Ana Paula was, was addressing, is they've managed to address those in ways that are effective without only going to data localization. There are other policy frameworks that are available. Now, let's be real. I think you, you mentioned in your presentation, Martin, that 
and a lot of government's public sector data, depending on the classification of the data, the sensitivity of the data, yes, even here in the United States, there are times where data is deemed too sensitive to be taken off premises. Get that, totally. Um, and every country needs a certain amount of flexibility around. What we recommend is, data, uh, there's data and there's data. Um, some data is more sensitive than others. And if we take a, a, a careful classification of that, this gets to the point that was made, I think, uh, by again, by Nigel and Anapala starting out about the value, the tremendous value of, of data sharing, the, the promise that lays out there. The more finely we can classify data and decide what treatment is needed for legitimate regulatory purposes, the better prospects we have for unleashing that potential. Stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Matthew. Martin. Uh, thanks a lot again, and uh, I think that uh, I managed to be a successful David ad advocate because I managed to tick off all my uh, all my fellow speakers. Although I have to say that I think I agree with everything that has been said before. First of all, I want to be clear: I don't think that this in for developing countries, especially disengaging from you know from. Uh, from this discussion is the solution. On the contrary, we uh, we, we we would uh, I would argue, and uh, you know, from my colleagues in the World Bank, we are strong supporters of uh, of this of discussions on on trade rules, including on digital trade at the WTO and elsewhere. Um, so, in fact, you know, we see the um, or I see the the low engagement of. Uh, of middle income and especially um, low income countries um, as uh, as a pitfall of the of the of the framework as it is right now and right now on out of 85 only three countries are LDCs um, we are, we would support many more countries engaging in this discussion because the way of uh, bringing those development challenges and those development con uh, concerns to the discussion is by participating not by staying away from it so, so we certainly, uh, so we, so we would, we support the process, and uh, but we support, but especially from a, you know, from if you want from a pers personal perspective, we support it with a little bit of a disappointment that is um, narrowed to this, uh, to this aspect of, uh, or, or has been extremely focused on data localization requirements. Um, whereas there are many other areas where uh, the uh, that probably are, are that are affecting the, the um, digital trade right now more than data localization requirements and are not being sufficiently covered uh, and I would agree again with uh, with Nigel saying uh, that saying that well trade rules do what trade rules do and uh, and they cannot be uh, the uh, and they are not the answer to everything so we cannot expect you know, certainly cannot expect uh, that uh, trade rules address interoperability requirements. You know, on, as uh, as it was suggesting suggested by uh, by Matthew, or uh, you know, pose a solution to uh, what is the access that law enforcement law enforcement should have to to personal data. Um, <clears throat> so these are all important questions. Probably. Um, that uh, are likely not to be uh, to be co that are not really going to be covered in a trade agreement, but should be really part of the discussion. The uh, <clears throat> trade trade agreements can uh, can cover uh, some small areas, but they can also link to other areas and uh, and and to other. Areas where regulatory harmonization and regulatory convergence is more uh, added, is more is is easier than uh, on a mercantilistic trade discussion, and uh, and this has been done in the WTO. If we look at the TBT agreement, if we look at the SPS agreement, um, these these agreements have strong uh, have elements of regulatory harmonization not in themselves but referring to to other uh, to other instruments and other fora and uh, and i would say that this should be the kind of approach that should be addressed in digital trade as well yes data localization 
is an important discussion and should be somewhere there, but it, but, uh, uh, but it should be part of a broader discussion that address many fundamentals of digital trade, uh, in, including the um, regulator, regulatory issues and regulatory harmonization that cannot be done at the WTO, but should be done in, in, in some other fora. And also um, a support um, an approach um, for technical assistance and capacity building in areas like uh, skills and, uh, and broadband connectivity uh, so that the discussion is not narrowed. So that data has a channel to, uh, to travel on. Anyway. So I hope that I, that makes peace a little bit with uh, with my with, with, with the other speakers. Um, and uh, well, I think there probably are more questions ahead. Thanks, Martin. Uh, you know, really appreciate all this. Definitely, no one's upset with you. I think these are all incredibly good points, and and are really, I mean, the the reason that we have the panel that we have is so we can really tease them out. So appreciate that. Um, oh, and speaking of teasing out, I, I want to uh, touch on that a little bit. I think in the trade community, we all tend to hyper focus on trade negotiations and agreements and commitments and what the exceptions are going to look like to those commitments. And, and that's a, a lot of that's all exceptionally important, right? When we're talking about all of these different things, um, we did have a question from the audience that I think feeds right into what um, I'm about to ask you. And, and Matthew, I'm coming to you first, so you can you can lay the groundwork for everybody else this time. So the question is, uh, you know, we, we're, we've been talking about the WTO and, and those trade negotiations, and, but I think that one of the things that's interesting, most interesting about working in technology policy is we can't think of anything in a silo. And I think that's something that we've all been talking about here, right? Is that there are other elements to this discussion that have to be addressed. So my question is, are, what are other international institutions or other international fora where these discussions are happening, should be happening, and how and in what way would these be linked to the conversations at the WTO? Um, and is that is it appropriate to do it that way? Uh, the question specifically that we that we had from the audience is, is is the WTO the right place to have this question about interoperability? Um, and and so if that. If yes, explain why, and if not, like what are the other um, institutions that should be part of this and, and how should that happen? It's a terrific question. Um, and I would say that uh, there is a, a legitimate and probably vigorous debate to be had on what things the WTO should be dealing with and what it shouldn't. Um, there are advocates that uh, have an interesting case to be made for focusing more on trade classic, if you will, and then others that say, hey, the world is changing uh, and trade is changing with it and the WTO needs to keep up with that. Um, I think where I land is somewhere in the middle, which is digital trade or, and technology policy has a place at the WTO to the extent that we are focused on the trade related elements. And as long as we keep our eye on the ball there, um, trade negotiators should focus on focusing on trade distortions and how to try and minimize those, limit those, while trying to carve out that space for legitimate regulation and then allowing experts to to dive into that in those spaces. That's a lot easier said than done. Um, but I think that's that's a, a North Star, if you will. In terms of where else those regulatory discussions can happen, the OECD has been a really helpful place for these discussions on tech policy generally. I understand that's only a subset of countries in the world. Um, I know that, and I'm not an expert on OECD matters, and I know others on this call uh, probably are more than me, but I know there are cooperation agreements often between the OECD and non-member economies, including emerging economies in some spaces and building that out further. I will say, even beyond that, I think there's some green field to be had here, um, recognizing the need for more multilateral cooperation on technology policy. Um, and especially where there is overlap of objectives and values among countries about the right ways to do this, maybe there are some new places to, to be created to do that. Whether it's new formal agreements on tech policy alliances, maybe it starts with informal discussions. It's a, it's a rapidly changing world and maybe our multilateral institutions need to evolve and evolve new branches with it. Thanks. Thanks, Matthew. Maybe Anna, can I come to you next? 
Um, I, I'm not, um, again, I'm not an expert on WTO and may not be the best person to answer that, but um, I will second Matthew on, uh, there are multiple places where um, a discussion around the digital economy um, could and should take place. Uh, the WTO is somewhat restricted. Uh, um, we've had a part of the discussion even at the the ITU. Uh, we've had a part of this discussion around um, an OCDE, and maybe um, this reflects a sense that I have in terms of um, internal uh, regulation as well. The challenge of the digital economy is because it's so transversal and it reaches everyone. No one is 100% responsible for that discussion. And we, we are on and off having to address different stakeholders, both at the national and international level, with different pieces of the, the discussion, which I think um, it has been um, a challenge uh, in itself. Uh, not looking at the, the digital economy as this whole new thing, uh, but breaking it up and allocating that um, in the, the existing forums um, that I believe has one of the, is one of the greatest challenges that we, we currently face. Thanks. Uh, and uh, Martin, maybe I can come to you next. I know you talked about this a little bit, but is there anything you would like to add? Uh, sure, thanks. I mean, yes, that, that is a great question. And, uh, and it's true, and certainly the WTO is not the only uh, uh, forum involved in this discussion right now. And, and uh, there are other venues that are doing a great work. Um, Matthew mentioned the, the OECD. What OECD in particularly has taken the lead on the regulation of digital taxes, and it's a, a, and it's a work on already ongoing, still uh, uh, uncertain where it's going to land. Uh, but that is, uh, you know, but that is a, a good forum to to take that, in, uh, to lead uh, that discussion. Uh, one uh, overarching uh, forum that I think that it has, uh, uh, that, that I think it's a pity that it has not been greatly involved, at least in providing uh, um, political guidance is the uh, is the G20. Uh, the G20 has taken up a few a few points on um, uh, on digital trade, but uh, but I think that it uh, broad as it is, it would uh, it would have uh, it, it has the possibility of having a, a more active role in connecting all these many dots and. Uh, and so far, it, I think it has, uh, yeah, it, 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 it hasn't gone there yet. Um, there are other, um, for us, well, for instance, we have the European, the, the Council of Europe um, issuing the, con the updated Convention 108 on, uh, on privacy, um, which is, well, you know, we can debate how good a, 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 an instrument it is, you know, for, um, but uh, what I think is important is, you know, for the trade negotiations and the WTO is to also to connect to those uh, uh, to those agreements uh, and to those initiatives. So, for instance, if the WTO is probably not going to be able to, uh, it's not the right forum to issue guidelines or principles on on privacy regulation, but it can but in its agreement can refer to other instruments as conventional at, at 108 uh, or the APEC cross-border privacy rules to the extent that those are um, recognized as adequate guidelines for uh, for cross-border data sharing then they could be in they could be a part of uh, the trade negotiations and they could be the instruments that provide some guidance on what are the, what is the way ahead in terms of uh, regulation for developing countries. That's my part. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nigel, do you have anything to, to add? Yeah, just a, a quickly, the question is a great one. It's essentially the only question in terms of whether we can build uh, an interoperable system. 
the internet by as a globally distributed uh, technology means that each country's regulations need to be interoperable by default. Countries can either recognize that or fight that. And so the challenge for us is obviously to, to uh, fight the latter while supporting the former. There's no uh, silver bullet to any one of these issues yet, but it's a matter of do we have the institutions where countries can come together to figure out how they uh, learn from best practices and early examples to build that so that overall the systems work together. Um, I, all the previous speakers have made all the right points in that there are a multiple of forums uh, that they can draw on. It's how you pull them together. Uh, the Inter-American Development Bank is doing great work and drawing in expertise there to help that region. Uh, the a APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation is doing likewise there. How can they, how, how do they feed into the discussion? How do they draw in these principles and apply it? And so, because there is no one approach at the moment, what I expect to see over the next 10 years is the emergence of those sort of regional efforts drawing on international best practices out of the G20, out of the OECD elsewhere for their members and at what fits their context to build interoperability. And I would love if that phrase became the defining objective of more countries as opposed to be frank, the European Union's drive for harmonisation in that there is one approach to data privacy. I think that's a very dangerous approach and is far more is unrealistic and untenable at, on a global basis, especially. And so I hope that on a regional basis, obviously also including now at the moment Africa and its efforts to sort of build a digital component on top of its recent FTA. And so hopefully over the 10 years, we see the emergence of these sort of broadly aligned, similarly based sort of efforts that together work. So I'll just bring sort of build on all the, the great comments previously and trying to outline my perfect vision for creating a new global digital economy. Thank you for that. Uh, I, so we have five minutes remaining. Um, you know, I have so many more questions for you. Unfortunately, we're about out of time. I'd be remiss though if I didn't bring in a question about the WTO moratorium on customs duties on electronic transmissions. There's a big development uh, angle to the dis current ongoing discussion about the role of the moratorium um, and and uh, and the revenue and policy space and, and these different kinds of questions. Um, I'm just going to throw out there to, to to get some views on what is the role of the moratorium as its uh, and its role in in particular when it comes to thinking about developing economies. Is the moratorium something that should be continued, made permanent? not continued, um, just just uh, share some views and maybe I'll just do an, an open free for all for, for those that want to, to jump in on this question. I'm happy to take the lead there. Uh, the, the moratorium really is a, a remarkable feat for the WTO and its members in showing foresight in, at that time, uh, protecting a nascent uh, internet economy as it was probably more likely called, free from tariffs. <laughs> And so it would seem to represent an enormous uh, a sort of uh, backwards regression to suddenly now adding cost and complication to a technology that uh, provides enormous low or no cost uh, access to trade uh, in how it largely removes the impact that geography has on trade. To reintroduce that at a stage where digital technologies allow countries and firms to engage in a way that they couldn't 20 years ago seems like a massive step in the wrong direction. And so I think that obviously our legitimate concerns, I think as, as Matthew related about how do you update domestic taxation regimes for the digital economy, legitimate sort of issue to dive there. But I think it would be a massive step in the wrong direction in terms of what we think can help digital development to allow countries to enact uh, tariffs on digital products. Thanks, Nigel. Anybody else want to, to jump in on this question? Maybe just to add um, and com you know, completely agree with Nigel. I think it's really interesting how this theme links to Martin's point and the one that I think has become perhaps the key theme of our discussion today about heterogeneity. Um, the thing about a, a customs moratorium on, on 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 data, which is essentially what we're talking, or or tariffs on data, if you will, which is which the moratorium is intended to prevent, it's a very seductive concept. 
Um, but I think it's, first of all, it's extremely, once you kind of get past the first pass at it, tricky to think about how you would even impose it. Are we talking about taxes on downloads? Maybe that's what you do. Are we talking about taxing metered cloud services? Maybe that's what some will have in mind. Now, multiply these kind of regimes by 190. Um, if the whole world decides to do this, it's really going to paralyze the ability to deliver cloud services across borders. Um, and that hurts everybody, right? The, for all the benefits that we spent the book of today talking about, we worry that, that the, the moratorium disappearing could, could really lead to a decline in the ability to access those cutting edge cloud services. I think, uh, as Nigel said, there's real questions to be had, right, about the distribution of, of incidents of taxation in the digital economy. And back to the institution I mentioned earlier, thank goodness, you know, the OECD and is, is leading some global conversations about exactly that issue. Um, let's let's let that process work out um, rather than uh, allow the costs that we just talked about to to creep uh, creep out and infect all of us. Thanks. Thanks, Matthew Martin. Uh, thanks, Cody. Actually, I don't have an answer to to that question. It's a matter that you know that we have been trying to understand. Um, and, uh, and we haven't been able to put the, the attention that we that, that we wanted to. But one thing that I think that, that I think that we is uh, is an important part of the discussion, and uh, and often gets uh, dismissed in, or not, in order to jump to the to the conclusion of whether the the moratorium is good and bad is the scope of the moratorium. And uh, and, and I think that we have to keep uh, on to think that actually the moratorium. Uh, is relatively narrow in in scope, and I want to. Uh, Matthew mentioned, you know, whether the, those are tariffs on on data, and the, the answer probably happily is that not really. Uh, tariffs on uh, most of the data, uh, most of sir, um, most of let's say data driven trade, uh, probably happens on the on the services here and uh, and there well we know the answer there is no scope for uh, uh, for tariffs not right now um, for and for most and for most countries under the commitments as they have now most countries have undertaken a, um, national treatment obligations for for cross border trade so so really there and tariffs are naturally inherently discriminatory measures so for trade so for most data, there is no scope for uh, um, uh, for tariffs, regardless of what happens to the moratorium. The moratorium instead you know, does apply to digital products, as, as Nigel said, and uh, that is probably I don't know, books, uh, songs, things that are that that you can download, but it's definitely not services. So it's a so it's a smaller part of of, of digital trade. Um, and whether it makes sense or it doesn't for that uh, for that segment of trade, I I, I don't know. We we still have to do the, the, the analysis. But the good news is that for most data um, data powered trade, well, that is out of the discussion. And then we already know that the principle that is usually on, uh, applies is national treatment, which means that there will be no tariffs. That they are no tariffs to data. Thank you. Thank you. And and Anna, is there anything that you wanted to add before we close here? I'll I'll pass on that one and respect the, our time restraint. All right. Well, uh, we are out of time, unfortunately. I mean, I think this last discussion is one that could take up a whole panel in and of itself. Um, and and I certainly had more questions, but. You know, I think this is um, a, a global discussion that will continue and that I, I think we are all going to continue to be part of. Um, so for those that are, are watching, um, you know, feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, I, 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 the, the Geneva Trade Week folks may have our contact info or you can, I'm sure you can find some of our info on our, on our organization's websites, um, but happy to follow up with anybody um, that's, that's tuning in. Uh, but other than that, thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much to the organizers of Geneva Trade Week. Um, they really did a great job, and we're really uh, you know honored to be here today. And thank you to all of our panelists. Really great thank discussion. You.
um, and, and appreciate you being here today. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.